This conference really will now be recorded. Is almost always about the value proposition of local. It's telling people in your community things that they wouldn't already know. We all know that there's this myopic, obsessive, um, uh, you know, audience attention on uh, the national news, um, particularly national politics at this moment, but in general. And so many people don't know what's going on down the street. They don't know what's happening in their communities and their regions and their counties. And they need to know that for democracy to function, but also to feel like they're connected, um, that they have full lives, that they are integrated inside of a space or a community that gives them meaning. And so for news oriented stations, everything that we talk about today all goes back to local. Um, what can you cover, share, spread, do that no other organization that may reach into your area um, but doesn't actually address these things what can they do for entertainment oriented stations like my music station specifically it really is about community connectedness um, a brand that makes you feel like when you listen to something <laughs> um, when you hear those call letters when you hear certain voices you feel connected and engaged and what i will tell you is that this is what digital media does the best um, you know, what we call legacy media, which is, you know, technically print, TV and radio, they tend to be unidirectional, right? We're giving people a product. But what digital allows us to do is to really enter into this conversation where we are hearing back from people more quickly um, than ever we had before. So just to have that frame as we go into hearing about these tools and strategies, What's, what can you give that no one else can give to the local? Or how can you help people connect to their community and to each other? That's how we want to use these tools. And just one of the reasons I say this most importantly is it's really easy to get trapped in tech and to think that if I push a button or if I watch a metric or if I use this SEO strategy um, that I'm going to connect with my audiences. And you all know already instinctively that it really it's about the work that we do every day um, that connects our communities, the information we give them. Um, and so I just want to keep the focus there and let the tech be a help and a support and an, an entryway into what we need to do. So let's just start really quick with SEO and analytics. Um, and then after each of these sections, I just want to take some questions for sure. So if you've got um, some specific questions or thoughts, I'd like to, to hear those. Um, when we talk about SEO, and analytics, it, there's really just one purpose. Um, search engine optimization, meaning that they will um, run across our content first online versus our competitor or that random guy who's blogging from his parents' basement or disinformation. Um, we want them to run into our good stuff first when they are looking for things. And that's what search engine optimization allows you to do. It essentially allows you to move up to that first page of Google knowing that most people don't go past that or allows you to kind of reach a broader audience. Analytics is in the backside of that. It's seeing how successful you were with your SEO. So analytics is kind of saying, okay, what is my audience clicking on? What are they seeing? What are they spending time with? Um, and all of you will have different things you want to kind of watch and measure with analytics, but it's kind of the front and back end of drawing in audiences, watching their behavior, making decisions then to build loyalty and relationship with them so that they do come back and then they enter into the cycle again right um, and so we just kind of we want to trap them in that beautiful thing that where we're communicating with them and they're communicating with us so when it let's talk about seo briefly and i'm going to give you some some big thoughts here um search engine optimization is at a really weird point right now. So if you um, are advanced in this area, you are probably using your content management system or the website tool that you use uh, to put in keywords and tags and categories. And you're looking at your H1s, your headlines, and you're writing in, you know, maybe you're looking at Google Trends and saying, okay, oh, this is this word is trending. Let me put it in my headline so I'll get more people on Google. Um, it used to be decently straightforward that you could implement a couple key steps with SEO, uh, like headlines and tags and things like that, and you could get people to your digital products. Um, SEO has changed dramatically just in the past six months. Uh, and I think it's important to use and think about SEO if you are a heavy SEO user as another tool in the toolbox, but we should not ever 
uh, put all of our faith in that box. Um, we should really be thinking about lots of different ways to get audiences to what we're doing. So um, the best practice with SEO is to figure out, um, and then I'll, I'll tell you what the wrench is in a second, is to figure out what language people are typing into search engines so that you can benefit from that language as well. So one of the best and easiest ways to do this is Google Trends. Um, Google Trends is a free tool that anyone can use if you're not familiar with it. And it allows you to track what language is happening um, most frequently um, across the internet. And you can do this in so many different ways, which is really fun. So let's say you're doing a story about the Georgia Bulldogs. Not that I have any favoritism, but I'm just saying, let's just say hypothetically. And you want to put the language in your headline or in your tags or in your social media post or any kind of digital product or platform that is going to allow you to come up earlier in people's search results. You can kind of juxtapose language against each other using Google Trends to see what terminology people are typing into Google the most so that you can use that terminology too so you will be in front of their eyeballs faster. Um, so it really is, it's kind of a gamification of the system, but we can see here that putting in Georgia football or UGA does much better than Georgia Bulldogs or just dogs or even sadly, go dogs. So this gives us a sense of what language we can use. And these small little changes in how I write my headline on my web story, how I put language on social media, um, it all drives people closer to your content because if they're putting in that exact phrase when they're searching and you have that exact phrase it's going to be a match you're going to come up higher um, and so that's the basic function of seo what's kind of fun is you can take a deep dive here in google trends and you can find out exactly where certain terms <laughs> this is kind of the funniest graph ever but uh, where certain terms are, are happening more than others you can even find regions or other things they're typing in in order to again try to capitalize on that traffic that's already running around on the internet uh, and allow you to draw them toward what you're doing. Um, so that's the goal of Google Trends. We can also pay attention to what's trending right now. So in the past 24 hours, this is what people are typing into Google. Um, and of course we can kind of see why some of these things are happening, other ones maybe a little bit uh, more suspect we can also kind of drill down and look at specifically what's happening in georgia in the past uh, wendy frosty flavors now i'm curious i wonder if they're introducing a new one right um we can see what people are talking about and then capitalize on it this is also by the way a great way to get story ideas um but using google trends is kind of the the gold standard when it comes to thinking about seo and so in the past we've pulled that information, we've seen what language is trending in the algorithms or what people are searching for. And then we basically like put that language like breadcrumbs all throughout our digital products in order to drive people there. Um, it is still a good strategy. I would encourage you to continue to do that, particularly if it doesn't take too much time. I will show you a tool that will save time for you here in a second. Uh, but things have changed a smidge. And part of that is because of uh, Google's new AI search. Um, and a lot of you are familiar with this um, from a per the perspective of um, when you type into Google, you can see lots of different things. Um, a lot of you, it was in beta for a long time, but now it's uh, kind of uh, out for the masses. And it essentially takes, uh, it crawls the internet and it takes all the information and creates a cute little paragraph. Um, so, for instance, in central Georgia today, I've got a weather forecast. I also have a crash, a uh, burglary suspect. Um, it looks like a CEO was arrested. And damaging wind occurs 19 days per year. That's kind of a weird one, right? <clears throat> now, down below that, I get to MAZ and write some other, some stations. Um, I find this fascinating and absolutely terrifying for several reasons that you've probably already guessed. Um, a lot of people with this new AI integration into Google search are gonna read the AI generated wrap up 
and they will not click on our stations. They will not go through to where that information came from. Now they do have these little links that are supposed to give us a sense of where they actually got the information. But again, we're talking about a burden of proof, like that's an extra click, right? Um, so I don't know how often or how dependent people are um, on, on moving through and actually resourcing this stuff. So the integration of AI summaries into Google searches really kind of turns SEO on its head. If people are going to see this first and if this is what they're going to believe, which, by the way, there's a really good chance that some of the things here are inaccurate um, because AI is not a real human being. Um, then we have a problem. Uh, we also have the hallucination effect when it comes to AI, where it thinks it's correct, but it doesn't really know for sure, but it's presenting it as fact. Um, and and that's that's troublesome. Um, but I think what we're seeing is kind of the de-emphasization of our news um, when it comes to those things uh, and the, uh, the emphasis on this tool. So my encouragement for you is 100% absolutely to keep using SEO when you can. But I think we do need to be cognizant that um, AI is kind of changing the game a little bit. And we have to think about other ways to make sure we build loyalty with our audiences um, besides for just trying to game that trend. One tool I want to show you very quickly is called uh, YesEO. And it is um, a plugin in Slack, um, if any of you use Slack that allows you to um i was signed in but then my sign in came out so give me just a second to um to, to pull this up um it is an, a, an app in slack that allows you to put in any story or any content that you want it runs it through both ai and google trends um kind of at the same time which is pretty neat um and uh, this is a lot of workspaces, y'all. I really need to work on that. <clears throat> um, and it will uh, essentially give you an option. Uh, so let me just show you how it works. It's down here as a Slack app. And uh, I can uh, put in a little, it's called prep. Um, and then it will allow me to, let me just pull this taxidermy story that we did for the Oglethorpe Echo. It'll allow me to put in any text I want, and then it will think about uh, where I want to run it. Sometimes it will do the county of Georgia. So you have to be careful with that. It'll ask you how quickly um, you want to have something ready, and it's going to run a report. It's pulling both AI, again, and Google Trends data in order to do that. And it's going to create a bunch of stuff for you automatically. Right now, this app is free. So if you use Slack, you can integrate it from the Slack app um, downloads for free. It's going to give me four or five suggested headlines. It's going to give me four or five suggested subheads. It's going to give me a whole slew of keywords. And it's also going to tell me how those keywords are performing in Google Trends um, with audiences right now. And the beauty about that is that it saves you so much time. We can absolutely go to Google Trends and I, I encourage you to do so and kind of fool around and see what's going on, but it's a little bit of crystal ball reading. Um, this is actually using an algorithm to our benefit to say, hey, this is what, oh, our report's ready, how exciting. This is what is going to work best to get people to your content on digital platforms. So um, I'm going to suggest headlines. We're just going to see. And it is using a large language model, which is pretty fun. It's pulling out keywords already about when that's actually there. And here are my headlines. I can also get descriptions and I can get subheads. Um, but all of these have the right language to perform well as SEO driven Google Trends headlines. Um, so I would encourage you if you do use Slack, this is kind of a time saver. Um, it's a free and easy tool to integrate SEO without going into Google Trends every time you want to do something. Uh, but at the same time, um, I think it allows you to um, 
kind of think critically about the words that you're using and what that may do to engage your audiences. Um, any questions on SEO as a, as, a, as a concept or things that you're seeing or questions that you have? I have a question. Have you yep. heard anything about um, Google or Microsoft penalizing sites SEO for using an abundance of AI content on their websites? <clears throat> right. So, I mean, this is a great question, Mackenzie. Um, there are two things that are happening right now that affect us from the penalization standpoint. Um, the first one unrelated to yours is that news organizations, uh, social media, particularly with Instagram and Facebook, are being downgraded in the algorithm. So that is one thing to keep in mind. Um, any content that you put on social media through Meta, um, they are now preferencing personal accounts um, over organizational accounts, particularly sharing news. Um, and that's not something we can control, which is why we never want to put our eggs and all in the social media basket. So that that penalty is active and existing, and I'm seeing absolute um, it, it, direct results from watching that happen. Uh, but yes, the second, and I haven't done a lot of reading on it, but I've absolutely seen chatter, particularly in the professional sphere, um, about AI-driven content being seen as problematic. Uh, now, what's interesting about that conceptually is that you can't really, there's not a foolproof detector for AI content. We have some tools out there that say they can detect AI or um, that look for kind of key markers, but uh, it is very possible, and I've done this with our students before, to put two things up in front of anyone um, and say, is this AI or not, and people struggle. Um, and as AI improves, uh, we're going to see more of that struggle. So I have absolutely heard that. Of course, proprietary companies are not going to tell us that probably outright. Um, but I do think that there's a general fear about um, AI content becoming too much of what we would find when we would Google. Right. right? So that when we type in anything, um, if 75% of it is AI generated, then we're talking about a huge trust issue conceptually. So mm -hmm. I think that's where they're coming from with the de-emphasization, but I think it's really, really um, almost like a misnomer to say, hey, we can find it and like tell the difference. I just yeah. don't know that that tool exists. Great yeah, question. Anyway. Any other thoughts or questions about SEO? Are you all using it? Do you, um, do you have any questions about if not, we can move on. I do have a question. Um, I had to step away from my desk um, when you were using um, Google Trends. Yeah. You were searching um, Georgia football. Did you just put that in the search engine and that just popped up? The yeah. So in Google Trends, you can create a new search um, and kind of search for any terms that you're, you're interested. Um, so we could obviously... Um, uh, explore any trends. Um, and so once you kind of start with the first one, you can add these comparative terms. So maybe we want to do and see which is performing better. <clears throat> That's interesting. Um, and then we can, and then from there, once we're looking at all the different concepts, um, we would, you could uh, limit it by region. You can limit it, um, by specific area, and you can actually also limit it specifically to YouTube, which I think is interesting. Uh, so once you are on the home page and you start with a term, then you can add on other terms to explore. Okay. Does that answer your question, Grace? Yes, thank you. Hey, Amanda, I have a quick question. Of so course. If people aren't using Slack, is there anything similar? The, mm -hmm. the YesCO is cool. Is there anything similar to Yes? CO that we can use without having to log on to Slack because a lot of companies are going, no, we don't want to do that. Right. No. And uh, sadly, not that I know of. Um, th the other way to handle it is just to go into Google Trends yourself. Um, and that's why this tool is, is kind of unique and, um, and we're using it um, at, at UGA, both at the Oglethorpe Echo and at News Source, um, because it, it is an integration that I am not seeing anywhere else. And I could, I could obviously not know about something that's out there. But to me, that's the quickest and easiest way to get that kind of feedback without going in and 
thinking through it yourself. Always good questions, always good questions. Okay, so if there's nothing else on, on SEO, again, so my, um, oh, I, I see a chat question. Let me, uh, Robbie asks, is there data about stations, digital audiences searching for specific brand station? Oh, oh, this is good, Robbie. Okay, so um, the question is, do we know if people are going in and not just searching for topics, right? about the crash that happened on 85 or whatever, um, but they are actually searching for uh, stations. Um, so this is such an interesting thing. You know, home pages used to be a thing and then home pages became not a thing because people stopped going, I'm going to go to WMAZ or the New York Times or the, um, you know, the CNN, right? They stopped kind of going to home pages for a long time uh, and let the, let Google, or let Facebook or whatever algorithm um, kind of decide for them. What we're seeing in the latest data, it's the 2024 digital news report uh, that I'm primarily from Reuters and Oxford that I'm primarily leaning on here, but you're seeing it in other places too, is that because of widespread distrust um, of digital algorithms, people are finally getting wise to the fact that, you know, what they see is not always in their control. Um, they maybe don't like that as well as they used to. Uh, people are starting to develop a little bit more brand loyalty again. And I do think that stations, this is a great moment to think about as much forward facing content where you introduce your talent, your anchors, your reporters, you show people process with behind the scenes content. I mean, this is the moment if, if people are starting to care about the brand again uh, and the station itself and wanna connect with it, we wanna to try to reach out to them and meet them halfway. I think probably a lot of people still don't put in your call letters, right? And go to your homepage and, and your analytics may show me different. Um, I don't see a lot of movement there, but I can say that they may be looking for a brand they trust, right? Inside of that Google search window, which is again, why you wanna get up on page one, if at all humanly possible, because very few people click to page two. Um, so if you can get a little bit higher, they may look at the first five results, like the one that we saw here, and they may be like, okay, um, I don't trust this, I do trust this, I've never heard of this, but oh, but I know that, right? And they're going to make those kind of determinations as far as where they click then. Uh, and I think that is worth, um, th that's worth trying to, to capitalize on SEO, but then also continue to build really good relationships with your audiences in other ways. Um, great question. I, I, I'm, I've, I'm encouraged by the data and the research I see in that area. Um, I, I want to pivot very quickly, or not very quickly, but I want to pivot to analytics. Um, again, this is a very deep topic that we could probably spend lots of time on. Uh, but I want to kind of frame this in the how can it work for you um, context. So the, the purpose of analytics across any digital product is in order to understand audience's behavior. It should never tell you what to do. Uh, it should never be something that your reporters or the people at your station watch like a hawk, right? We, we've had news organizations in the past uh, that have done that and, and much to the demoralization of the people involved and to some degree their demise. Um, None of us are going after clicks for clicks sake, um, but it really is a really nice piece of the puzzle to say, wow, people are really interested in this or people really spent a lot of time with this piece or this video or um, and it allows us to just understand our audience better. Um, I think of it like just a, like a, just a, another part of the conversation. So, you know, my larger question is how much are stations, and we work with a lot of them at the GAB, how much are they using audience data to really drive what they do and also to help support revenue? Um, and I think that there's a, a really good argument to be made that you can really figure out where people are spending time and then try to monetize those places and those uh, stories and that kind of coverage um, as well. So I think it can work in, in, in both aspects. Um, so when it comes to analytics, there's lots of terminology and I put some terminology kind of here on this page. Um, these are kind of the keywords that you need to know. There's more, um, 
you know, analytics is kind of the whole shebang. Metrics are specific little things that you're looking at inside of the analytics. And then we talk a lot about KPIs. Um, our students coming out of the University of Georgia are trained in this. There are specific metrics that you want to focus on. So please, uh, please hear me when I say you should not follow all the things. You should not be on all the platforms. You should not cover every story. You should not, right? I mean, no one uh, can do a quality job at doing everything all the time. But are there a few things that you're just really interested in knowing how your audience is reacting, responding to, or, or what they're doing? So um, when we talk about our audience, that's everybody. But there are two kind of numbers that we pay attention to in analytics. The first one is reach. This is how many people basically have the potential <laughs> uh, to engage with our content. Um, so sometimes they're called impressions, sometimes they're called views, every platform's a little bit different, but reach is like, it's the, the potential of someone to be able to see something or the fact that they scrolled by it and they could have interacted with it if they wanted to. That number was something we heavily leaned on when analytics first came out. And then we realized that was probably not really good because like your five-year-old, um, you know, nephew or niece could grab the phone and, you know, spend a lot of time scrolling through, but that doesn't mean you've actually reached anybody. Um, so now we've really leaned into engagement. And this is the number uh, of when someone does something beyond just scrolling past. It can be anything. Engagement is a kind of a, a, a broad tent. Shares, likes, retweets, quotes, uh, emoji reactions, comments. But engagement is that level up where someone actually takes a minute and wants to do something. Side note, in general, on digital platforms, basically everything we put out there should have a call for engagement. Um, that's what makes digital worthwhile. If we're just copying and pasting our headlines or our information or our photos or our videos and we're just putting them on social, everyone's just going to scroll past. If we ask them a question about the video that they just watched, if we ask them to share one of their own pictures from the event, if we um, ask them to react with a specific emoji or vote in a poll or, um, or share the content with a group that might be interested, all of a sudden we'll get more engagement. Uh, people are so inundated with content right now that they don't always know what to do besides for keep scrolling, right? It's an endless algorithm. And so it's important that as a station, you kind of prompt them. They may not react the way you want to, and that's fine, but at least give them an idea of how they could engage with you. Uh, and I think you'll see those engagement numbers go up, and that's really what we probably want to watch more than anything else. Two other things that we're interested in, one is called the bounce rate. That is the percentage of people who just look at one thing on our website and then leave. So they found us through like an SEO, right? Like we ended up on page one of Google. Great. They go to one article and then they leave and like never come back again. Uh, we want bounce rates are like golf rates, right? We, or golf scores. We want them to be low. We want people to, once they're on our digital product, we want them to kind of hang out, kind of look at stuff, right? Um, click other things. Uh, so we can do lots of different things in social strategy. And, and my students and I can work with you on that, on how to like keep them with us. Uh, but we do always watch our bounce rates because that's an interesting, um, you know, did they, they come for one thing and leave or did they become a loyal part of our audience? And then, of course, we're always interested in, in demographics. Who are the people um, who are engaging in this content or interested in this story or listening to this podcast? Um, you know, we're, we're always interested in that. And analytics can tell us that, which is which is great. So. Um, you know, analytics come in lots of every, um, oh, okay, great. Uh, analytics come in lots of different ways and places. Um, this is Google Analytics. I guess we're unchecking all and saving because that's a new thing. Uh, and I'm not gonna give you a primer on Google Analytics specifically right now, but again, we can, uh, we can work on that. I would love to work on that with you and so would my students. Um, but this is one of those things that if, if you've got a, a, a newsroom, um, I would keep like a monitor <laughs> kind of going uh, with possibly this real time um, or something else. And you can actually just see what people, so this is the Oglethorpe Echo. Uh, it's a news organization that is run out of the University of Georgia. Uh, we can see that we've got six active users in the last minute. We can also see what where they came from 
Facebook, we can also see exactly what they're reading. This obituary, this historic mills thing, um, a police station story, that was a nice profile we did on somebody. So we can get so much information that can just be kind of on in the newsroom that we're just watching. And I think particularly for digital, that is really encouraging, right? Like, oh, someone's looking at my story right now. And we will have hits from Dublin. We'll have hits from, I mean, all kinds of different places um, across America because of SEO. And that's, again, just really kind of fun to be able to see who is doing what um, and what's happening. Um, but we can also just get so much data about what's being read and what people care about and how long they are spending um, on these things. And so we know that in Oglethorpe County, the, the drama over the jail and a possible new truck stop, goodness and mercy, is causing some some headaches for people. And these are the stories where people are really getting engaged. So do you know what we're going to do next week? A follow on the truck stop story. Um, and so we can also talk to the owners, talk to the Chamber of Commerce and think about monetizing, right? I mean, there's lots of different ways that we can employ this data. It doesn't have to be super fancy, though. And so I will show you the very, very low fi This is a Google Sheet, the way that our students track things. It looks big, but it's not. So for every week, we look at all of our digital products, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, our website, and our email newsletter. And we just look at three things. Our audience grew or no change. How many active users? How many simple engagements of any kind happened on that platform, any comment or anything? And then the stories that are doing the best, the content that people are really resonating with. And what's always interesting to me about when I take a little bit of time and I spend some time with analytics is what's working on Facebook is never what's working on YouTube. And what's working on Instagram is absolutely not what's working on the website, right? And so a lot of times because we're short staffed and because we don't have a lot of time, which I completely understand, we end up throwing everything on all the platforms and products. And we end up actually spending more time than we need to doing that. The more the analytics allows us to be strategic and think, okay, I know that these types of stories work on Facebook. I'm just going to post that story. I'm not going to post every other story <laughs> that I, you know, that we did or any other piece of information. Or I know that the giveaways really work well on Instagram. I'm going to spend my time doing that. So being strategic hopefully will save you time. You will know where things are performing well and where to put them. And then you can make choices based on that. Um, one just, I mean, we've already kind of talked about this, but the monetization note, you know, if you know that certain types of content or certain types of stories working well on certain platforms, then you can monetize that better. And you've got data to prove it, right? So, I mean, that's the, that's, you know, all of us, a lot of us come from time when we didn't have this information. Um, I remember just going, I hope they like this, what's on the front page, right? I mean, like, that's, that's all we had to go on. Um, this allows us to have a data-driven decision. And not all of our decisions should be driven by this data. Kim Kardashian is always high in Google Analytics. It doesn't mean I'm putting her as, you know, in my A block or, you know, in my afternoon drive radio slot. But it does give me a sense of what the audience is doing, what they're thinking, and then how I can really capitalize on that and give them the information they need. Um, any questions or thoughts about analytics? We had a question in the chat from Kathy. Oh, oh. let me get that. Thanks, Mackenzie. You're great. Okay. Um, smart up. Oh, smart up. <laughs> Startup, small staff, mostly volunteers. Oh, yes. Oh, Kathy. Kathy, let's talk. Kathy. Um, <clears throat> I would love for you to apply for the Digital Natives program. I'll give you the link at the end. And this would exactly be something a student could come in um, and set you up. What's cool about Google Analytics specifically is they, once you get it set up the way you want, tracking the KPIs, the things you want to track, it will email you a report every morning. 
So you don't have to go in there and click buttons and find stuff. It will actually just give you the numbers you need and you can put them in a spreadsheet or you can just look at them and discuss them at your, you know, your monthly meeting, you know, whatever it is. Uh, but we can absolutely set that up for you. And our students are really good at that. So um, pay attention when I talk about the digital natives program, because that is something a student would love to help you with. Um, Dr. Bright, I had a question. Yes. So you've had the digital natives program going on for a while. A lot of my students are some of your students that have been there and they report back on how different organizations operate and integrate all this right. information. Um, very small staffs, you know, you, it, it, you optimally maybe, although I'm not sure about this, you would have someone dedicated to this. But I have begun to wonder um, if you've noticed some newsrooms that have designed or developed a workflow that makes this top of mind for everyone. You know, in, in my mm -hmm. dream world, <clears throat> every reporter is, is you know setting up this report for all their work um so that this oh. integrated throughout <clears throat> organizations have you seen any newsrooms that have found a, a a particularly good um workflow for this that integrates this throughout the newsroom so the two yeah well two maybe three things um that i've seen and i think we always want to be cognizant of small staffs not a lot of time and we can't hire somebody extra to do this because i think that's where most people are at so given that context um and with that in mind um number one i think um having a visual display again even if you just like set up a computer monitor or um, a, like you throw it up on a tv like apple tv or something or anything that can keep it kind of live in the newsroom all the time really does help keep it top of mind and we we've, we've seen a lot of really good um positive things from that um but two you don't have to look at analytics every day most of you would not i mean once a week once a month once every other week is fine it, it is not something that needs to be so heavily part of your workflow unless you are cranking out you know washington post volume information right or like nbc corporate volume information chances are um you can look every other week or once a month even and just determine trends and think about what your audience is doing critically where i've seen the most success is one of two ways that someone in the newsroom, um, whether it's a manager or perhaps one of the reporters that's younger or tech savvy, like people from our program who, who come out, um, can either just make it a quick five minute beginning of your news meetings or your staff meetings, right? Where you go in and you, no one needs to read the chart to anybody, like and tell them all the numbers and the metrics, people's eyes will glaze over. But they just said, I spent 10 minutes with the analytics for the month. Here are the three things you should know three bullet points, and that sets the tone for the staff meeting for the day. Here's what our audience is doing. The other way to do it is doing through whatever inner communication channels that you have, whether it's email or something like Slack or Microsoft Teams or, you know, and just have someone once a month, once every other week, do a quick, here's our analytics. Maybe you can link them to the bigger report if someone's feeling nerdy and wants to sift through the data, right? But ultimately, just here are the three big things I pulled out of the data for this month. Um, and then just communicate that to the whole staff, right? Versus, you know, whatever communication channel um, that you use. I think that kind of uh, putting it in the workflow consistently, which is what I hear you saying, Dodie, like making it something that we do, not, all, not, not every day, but consistently enough, will keep it top of mind and, and help us remember that we're serving audiences that have feelings about things. Um, and, and they're interested in things sometimes that we're not interested in or vice versa. And, and so I think that helps. Thank you. Any other analytics questions or thoughts before we go on to emerging tools? <clears throat> okay. But obviously feel free to put it in the chat as well. Uh, so it is a brave new world and it's not just an Atlas Huxley book that I read like four times because I really liked it. Um, it is. I mean, I'm I direct the innovation lab um, out of UGA um, and Jody knows this and I am absolutely enamored with all shiny new things and it is hard for me to keep up now. I mean, things have grown so exponentially. The tools are emerging new all the time, uh, but 
we do have a digital strategy guide I'll talk about at the end where I'm constantly updating. Um, and so I would encourage you to, to get a copy of that. Uh, but, but just know that if you feel like, oh my gosh, I have no idea like what's going on in digital media, we are all feeling that way. It is happening fast. So what you want to do with this part of the session is just keep your ears open for like a tool or two that you may want to just play with, right? That you may think, hey, this may be cool. We could integrate this. This could work for my station uh, in some meaningful way. But do realize it's happening at breakneck speed right now. And that's okay. Um, you know, I think eventually we will probably settle into a few key, key ideas. So I want to talk about the elephant in the room first. Um, I'm, I'm almost tired of talking about AI, right? Like, uh, but it is obviously a huge part of what we're doing. Uh, this is a part of um, a screenshot from uh, Associated Press's AP initiative, and they are doing some really nice things about tracking where it's using and how it's being used in newsrooms, AI specifically. And I'm going to show you some tools um, that are allowing these things to happen. But the thing that I would encourage you the most with these emerging tools, particularly with AI tools, is that they need to be helpful to you. <laughs> um, there's lots of stuff that will make up lots of stuff or, you know, create things that aren't true. And we, we, we should feel uneasy about that. But there are a lot of things that should make your workflows faster and easier once you get it under your fingers and should make your job a little bit lighter, but still be ethical. So, of course, the most important thing about AI use is that we're transparent. You cannot just put AI people randomly in places <laughs> or AI content randomly in places or images without letting your audience know. And this is the journalism professor and me talking. We have to be so, so, so careful and so clear because the use of AI can help our workflow and can help us do more for our communities, but it also could basically destroy the trust that we have left. Um, and so we, being thoughtful about these integrations is of utmost importance. Um, I'm gonna show you some of my favorite tools right now that I think are the most interesting or useful. But again, with the caveat that if you're going to use them in any way that creates content that faces an audience, I would please, please, please disclose it um, and just say that AI was used as part of this. Uh, so just as a quick primer, just in case anyone doesn't know, um, there are two types of AI running around out there. Predictive is the kind that we've been mostly comfortable with for the last five to 10 years. So asking Siri a question or, um, you know, when we type in Google and it finishes the line, that's called predictive AI. Um, and it's basically just making a prediction about what you want. Um, based on its algorithm. Uh, predictive AI seems okay, uh, but then came generative AI. And generative AI is fundamentally different because it makes something brand new. So anything made with generative AI has never existed before in the history of humankind. And what it really throws our students all the time is when we use generative AI, like Mackenzie asked earlier, we can't tell it's AI or not. Um, because we can't do a reverse Google image search or we can't like see if it showed up somewhere else because it's brand new. So it really is a machine algorithm that is trained on millions of images or thoughts or ideas or pieces of research. It learns from them and then it creates something brand new out of them. Now, AI is not perfect right now. As we all know, we have six fingered people. We have um, the hallucination effect, which says that, you know, that um, John F. Kennedy is still president. I mean, you can find examples all over the place of AI not exactly thinking right, but it will get better. <clears throat> uh, the more it's trained and the more we use it, it, it will grow. So just a, a couple of quick applications. Um, our students use Otter which is a transcription tool, um, basically like they use air. Uh, it, it is their favorite thing of all time. Um, but Otter actually has a lot of um, AI integrations, uh, which, is, which is kind of fun. Um, and it will allow you to um, create, um, it will allow you to chat with it. Um, and it will allow you to take any interviews that you record on it and it will create a summary or it will create more content from it. 
Um, and so just as, um, just so you all know, it is a really nice way if you've, you know, recorded some sound or you've done an interview to help think through and to process what the big ideas were. Of course, we always want to do this with thoughtfulness. Um, but we have, um, for instance, this is an interview one of our reporters did for the Echo. And there's the transcript of very specifically, right, them talking, which is fine. But it also gives a summary of that discussion using AI, plus action items it believes the reporter should take after the interview or that maybe the candidate was talking about taking, plus an outline of the main ideas of the interview. To me, this is one of the coolest parts about AI um, and because it's allowing us, it's not telling us what to do, but it's just an aid, it's a help, right? Um, it's allowing us to see our content in a different way. So that's Otter. Um, it is free to a point, as most things. So if you, if you need to record or transcribe more things, um, you have to be careful with that. The second one is called Perplexity. Um, and Perplexity is an interesting tool um, that allows you to uh, take deep dives from a research perspective. So it's kind of like that geeky friend that you have that reads too much about everything. Um, and it will allow you to ask kind of high level questions or research based or conceptual questions. And then it will essentially scrape all of the research and information out there and give you kind of a high level understanding of a complex topic. Um, again, if, if you're reading in on a story or an idea, um, this can be really useful and uh, save some time. Uh, again, you never want to put all of your eggs in this basket, right? Because it's AI and we, we know it, it can make mistakes. But people, again, are finding this more and more accurate um, and more and more useful to really understanding, say, the concept of longevity very quickly. Um, it also allows you to ask follow-up questions and then dive deeper into those. Uh, so I have found this really useful when I'm trying to quickly research a concept. That's a fun AI tool. ChatGPT, I think you all probably uh, know about this one pretty well. Um, and it will allow you to write a radio um, script for a car crash on I-85. Um, <clears throat> It is a little freaky how it even tries to put in that sound, right? <laughs> um, this is a tool when we're talking with our students uh, from a journalistic perspective specifically, uh, is a starting point, it's a brainstorming tool. Um, we would never say use these grips, but we all have times when we get some writer's block or you know, we feel like, oh, how would I, how could I phrase this differently? Um, also, we have put code um, like actual like website code into chat GPT and it will correct it for us. I mean, it's, it's just, it's lovely in that way. Um, so it, this parts of this sound ridiculous, but ultimately it gives you a starting point that may again, save you time for what you're trying to achieve. Uh, I like to think of it as those two friends that you always bounce ideas off of. Well, now you can let them be and they can spend time with their dogs and cats and you know children and you can use ChatGPT to bounce ideas off of. Um, so I think there are some applications there that are useful for us. Um, Dolly is a visual version of this um, through OpenAI, if it will open, it's a little bit um, a little bit gimmicky sometimes. Open AI is a really, uh, really scary but good. They're doing both video and visual um, uh, ramifications for what they do, which I think is great. Um, but these are all images made with Dolly that were based on prompts. So what's interesting is you can actually read the prompt, a photo of a Samoyed dog with its tongue out hugging a white Siamese cat. So someone typed that into Dolly and they got this picture. What's important to remember here is that the dog and the cat don't exist. They are absolutely completely created. They, they have never existed. They don't, you know, you can't go find them anywhere. Um, they are trained and you can see some little imperfections. Um, Here's a photo of a teddy bear on a skateboard in Times Square. It can do art as well as photorealistic things. 
Uh, and I am seeing an increasing use in media companies as long as it's disclosed <laughs> uh, of people using this for images. Now, as a, a journalist, I have to say, oh my gosh, please just use photographers, right? <laughs> um, and you go out and do the real thing. But I think that there are times and places where this does make sense if it's fully disclosed. Um, a couple other things I want to show you um, very briefly. Uh, and again, Mackenzie will send out this slide deck, I'm sure, because she's so great. Um, of other tools that you may find kind of interesting in addition to AI, although I do have one more AI one I want to show you real quick. Um, the brand, the most brand new tool that I have played with that I am definitely enjoying is called Notebook LM. Uh, it's just out of beta. And what you do is you actually upload stories to it. Um, and it allows you to, uh, it not only creates a summary and a study guide and an FAQ and a timeline and a briefing doc and a table of contents for whatever the reporting is. It also creates um, a podcast. Uh, so I'm not sure if you'll all be able to hear this because I never know how sound sharing goes, but we're gonna give this a shot. Can you all hear that? No. Mm. I always hate audio controls here. Um, what I will say is that um, it is essentially creating two people talking about your issue, um, which is which is fascinating. Um, I would encourage you to, to check it out. My 12 year old thinks it's the coolest thing that she has ever seen in her life. Um, but it also allows for you to ask questions and someone will talk back to you just based on being trained on this story. Uh, it's probably one of the coolest AI implementations that I've seen in a long time. Um, we had a couple extra questions. And so um, I'm just gonna very quickly um, talk through some of these tools. All of these tools are visual in nature. Uh, and interactive in nature because people do love clicking things. And so we use a tool on a regular basis called Headliner that allows you to create, just upload audio and then create a captioned or this kind of uh, voice um, uh, wave and then embed this on social media. Um, Headliner and a, a similar program called Audiogram are amazing tools specifically for radio stations to be able to share a visual component um, and uh, especially on digital platforms and get a little bit more engagement. Um, and this is free again to a point, um, but you just upload the audio, you, you actually uh, add the image in the background or you can kind of design the way it looks. And then what's really neat about this is it allows you, um, or it actually automatically does the subtitles. You can go in and make changes if it hears it wrong, but it 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 does those automatically, um, which is pretty neat. There are several other tools that I would kind of encourage you to take a look at. Um, some basic data tools that are free right now called Data Wrapper and Flourish. Uh, they allow you to make basic bar graphs and charts, but also more advanced things that are interactive. Um, that you can use um, to explore. And then there are some fun tools that allow you to build things, say on your website, that have almost like an immersive experience to it. Um, and so this is a tool called Adobe Express, where someone took a story that had photos and video and audio and made it like a scrolly telling um, piece. And this, the thing that's really amazing about some of these free tools is that they don't require coding. Uh, all you do is drag and drop the content into them. And so um, I would encourage you, if you wanna play around with any of these tools that you're seeing right here, um, they'll be linked in the, in, the, in the slides and you can do that. But these again are also um, really amazing uh, ways for you to connect with our students. Um, so that you can um, uh, have them say, hey, I really want to look at one of these tools. Can you sit down with me and look at that? So last quick pitch here. Um, we have two programs um, that allow students to help you with any of these things. 
Um, we have innovation fellows that are with you for, it says one semester, but it's actually one year now, um, one year. Um, and we place a couple of those every year. Uh, so if you're interested, there's an application at this link. Um, it's on the GAB website. But we also have upcoming, just in a few weeks, the Digital Natives program. Uh, this is where students spend a few days or to a week in your newsroom and help you achieve a very specific digital goal. So Kathy, I would love to see your name on that list. Um, that's the link, or you can just Google Grady Digital Natives. Our application deadline actually is November 1st, and then we're going to place five students uh, in stations and newsrooms across the state. But if those don't work for you, you can always schedule time with me. So on the GAB website, there is a place and a way for you to grab 30 minutes with me and we can talk through strategy or whatever you want to regarding SEO, analytics, interactive tools, AI, or just about anything else. Um, Okay, Mackenzie, are we at time? Oh, oh, she's gone. Okay, I believe we are at time. Um, any last questions I can answer? Obviously, if you need to log off to go get a sandwich, I fully respect that. Are there any questions or anything I can answer right now? No, just thank you for keeping up with all this. Absolutely. Thanks, Robbie. Thanks, Grace. Feel free to stay on and ask a question if you want to and or um, get in touch with me. Uh, my email is amanda.bright at uga.edu, uh, but obviously you can Google me too. I should show up high on the SEO, fingers crossed. Thank you all, have a great Friday. Real quick, Amanda. Yes. Um, I'm Kathy. <clears throat> Very we good. Are not, yeah, we are not a newsroom. We're an entertainment, we're a Catholic radio yep. station. Is it still okay to, okay. I it absolutely is. Yes. Okay. Yes, 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 yes. Um, and I don't know, you know, I don't know how many applications we're going to have at any time. You never know um, what the what the pool looks like. But typically what I do in that kind of situation, I just ask my students, I'm like, hey, is, like, if, is anybody like excited about working with, because um, we, we've worked with a, a Christian radio station before and a Christian TV station before. And so okay. some students are like, yeah, sign me up. Right. Um, yeah. So uh, we, if we can find somebody who's interested and you are happy with, you know, for whatever your goal is, then no problem at all. We want to help everybody. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much. I'll, um, I'll look that up and fill that out. Great. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye.